I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-11, Wednesday, March 24th. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I'd like to welcome back John, who had to miss last week's show because he was down in Miami Beach partying with his bros. <laughs> yeah, I saw you. Why? You should have been wearing your mask, John, you know, as you were dancing to uh, the weekend. You dance to the weekend? Oh, no. Joe's laughing. <laughs> yes. Okay. Hi, John. Welcome back. D- did you introduce yourself yet, Bill? No, you forgot. No, probably not. You're asking a lot too much of me. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Jonathan Green, uh, general manager of DJ Stable. And, you know, you guys put together a really nice show last week, but I am damn glad to be back. We're glad to have you. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Designed with flexibility in mind, the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale is back. The excitement of Derby Week, a new integrated format featuring an enhanced all-digital catalog, the option to sell horses on-site in the Keeneland sales ring or from their off-site location with live and remote bidding from buyers around the world. The April Horses of Racing Age sale is Monday, April 26th. Entries are open now. So last week we had our big finale weekend at Fairgrounds. We had a couple of interesting results. We're going to start with the Louisiana Derby and we'll talk a little bit about the Fairgrounds Oaks. Uh, two, two observations for me about the Louisiana Derby. Neither are particularly ground, groundbreaking. One, aggressive riding pays off. Joel Rosario took that horse to the front by design and went 23 and, and a decent, decent half and kept going because he took the bull by the horns and made the other horses chase him and then get, get discouraged in the lane. So that to me is, is a real lesson for people, for riders who like to stop and grab on the brakes that, you know, you take the bull by the horns, you're aggressive, you, you know, like I said, you make them chase you. The other horse, it's harder for other horses to chase you while going just a modicum slower than you and then pass you in the lane. So shout out to Joel Rosario, who's having an unbelievable year. If you look at his, his grade stakes and grade one totals, like it's obviously a long time to go in the year, but he is so far, far and away, the favorite to win champion Chuck. He's having a terrific year. The second thing is, I don't know that it's a great look when an assistant trainer ships in a horse from across the country and wins a million dollar race. You know, I, this is something that I, I, I shouldn't know Leandro Mora's name, but I do know it really well because Doug O'Neill's gotten suspended a bunch of times and he's had to fill in as the named trainer on a lot of horses. So not sure what fairgrounds could have done about that. You know, it's, it wasn't in their jurisdiction. So it's not like they could have, it's not like they suspended Doug O'Neill. Nevertheless, it always, it's a little funky to have an assistant trainer ship a horse in and win a million dollar race. I'll toss it over to you guys. Yeah, Joe, agree as usual with most of the things that you said. Um, the thing about the Louisiana Derby that resonated with me is that if you look at Hot Rod Charlie, before Life is Good was heard, what would you say? Maybe the fourth, fifth best three-year-old in California. And then he comes in. And it wasn't a stellar Louisiana Derby field, but it was pretty darn good. You had some really decent horses in there. So the California horse comes in and wins the week before concert tour and his stable mate run one, two out of California for Baffert in the rebel. So look, you know, you've got uh, an elusive quality and greatest honor. You've got two very good horses that are not based in California, but I think it's a fair statement right now to say that the, probably the toughest division is going to come out of California. Um, the uh, race you didn't mention, the Mervyn Muniz, uh, looks like Colonel Liam is going to develop into a turf star. I mean, they paid seven figures for him. I don't think at the time they thought, oh, my God, we're going to win the Mervyn Muniz someday with this horse. You know, obviously they wanted to try to win major races on the dirt. But, you know, he's discovered this talent right now. And uh, he won again coming off the Pegasus World Cup Invitational. So uh, he looks like he's going to be, uh, you know, a, a potential star in that division. And, you know, the, uh, the Fairgrounds Oaks, it's kind of neat. I mean, we the, you have uh, – these two horses ran against each other three straight times, Travel Column and Clarier. It will be four of the Kentucky Oaks. I mean, this is a throwback to like a Ferned and Alley Dar or something like that. I mean, you never see that anymore. Uh, right now, Travel Column, by the virtue of the win in the Oaks, looks like in the Fairgrounds Oaks, looks like the horse to beat or will be the favorite in the Kentucky Oaks coming up in uh, on the last Friday in April. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, you stole a little bit of my thunder with regard to Hot Rod Charlie, Joe, because it, it was it was really, you know, a, a great bit of riding by Rosario. I think he is on top of the game, like like you, like you said before. Half brother to Mitali, also showed her, you know, speed, good turn of foot, one of the best uh, sprinters of the past couple of years. So the fact that, that Rosario had enough confidence in Hot Rod Charlie to actually force the pace and go to lead and then give the horse a break. Um, you know, the, the the second to last quarter, he went in 25 and one. So he gave the horse a breather to be able to go down the stretch and, and finish up uh, strongly. And, and it was really an impressive race. Um, Midnight Bourbon didn't run a bad race. Uh, you know, still one of the top contenders, I think, for the Kentucky Derby. And you still have to consider him. Uh, when you're when you're betting your uh, exactas and trifectas, you know, for the Derby in, in, a, in a month or so. Um, and, and let's talk a little bit about Obasis, who, you know, really broke poorly, kind of sat way off it, kept the rail trip um, and then, you know, cut the corner and made a big run down the down the lane and almost got second. I mean, you know, really, if, if things had changed a little bit, probably would have been second. And maybe we'd be talking about him a little bit more, um, you know, as far as. The, the, as distances go further, is he going to be able to improve and continue to do well? But he had a rail trip, um, but ran a very game third, I think, in in the uh, in the Louisiana Derby. But Bill, to, to your point, you know, we've been talking the past couple of weeks about Santa Anita, uh, California, and Louisiana, and those are the real hotbeds for the three year olds this year. And I think they're proving it. Um, you know, you, you kind of shuffle the deck on on who's on top right now. But um, so far, those racing jurisdictions have proven to be, um, you know, the, the the springboard for some of these top three-year-olds. Um, the only thing I want to mention about the Fairground Oaks, and again, it was a very impressive race. I don't know if I would say Ali Dar affirmed esque, but you know, at least those two horses are battling each other all the time, which is really great for the industry. Um, how about the fact that Travel Column ran a faster mile than Hot Rod Charlie? She went a fifth of a second faster than Hot Rod Charlie and Midnight Bourbon did um, in the Louisiana Derby. And the thing that boggles my mind, and, and I'll never get my mind around the exact uh, quantification of buyer numbers, but at the mile mark, the Phillies ran faster. Travel Column got a 90 buyer, and Hot Rod Charlie got a 99 buyer, so almost 10% faster for Hot Rod Charlie. And I know they went a little further, and that that you know goes into the you know into the formula as far as how they come up with the final number, but. I was a little surprised that Travel Column's buyer number, not that that's the be all and end all, but that it wasn't closer to the boys. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, I think, to make buyer figures when you have outlier distances, like a mile and three sixteenths. I don't think, you know, it's hard to make an apples to apples comparison to shorter races when the run ups are different. Um, so, and I think a lot of times there is a little bit of guesstimation based on what the horses had run previously. Uh, that's where Bill gets himself in trouble a little bit, confirming, <laughs> comparing a firm in Alley Dart to Travel Common Clarier and <laughs> Charlatan to Seattle Slew. He's, he's prone to hyperbole, but that's, that's why we like him. Um, that's why he's interesting. But uh, no, Mandaloon, I thought was a big story how poorly he ran because he didn't run a single step. I thought Proxy ran okay. He got squeezed a little bit at the start. And, he, you know, he was kind of trying to close into a pace that held together. But Mandaloon was terrible. And I don't, I don't know what the explanation was. We'll see where if, you know, if he still makes it to the Derby. I think it's hard to enter a horse off of that kind of performance. Oh, Bezos, I would have loved if he had gotten up for second. I, If you remember, I was touting him before the Risen Star, and I think he's a, he's a nice horse because he's he had to stretch out from six furlongs to a mile and an eighth in the Risen Star, which is not easy to do, and was wide around both turns and ran fourth, ran an okay race, and then was really flying late in that race on Saturday. And kind of reminded me of another horse that I could have used to get up was uh, Enforceable in the New Orleans Classic early earlier in the card where he like didn't seem like he was running at all until like maybe the final 16th and then was flying up the inside and just missed. Chess Chief ended up winning that race in a photo with Owendale, who's just he's such a disappointment, Owendale. I got to say, like he's he's failed at so many short prices. And to his credit, he showed a little bit more speed than he usually does in that race, but he still couldn't get the job done. Um, but I digress. The, with Travel Column, you know, I said it on Twitter at the time that I think she's stamped herself as the Oaks favorite. There are still some races that are left to run. We have the uh, Gazelle at Aqueduct. We have the Santa Anita Oaks. We have the Ashland. We have the Fantasy. 
So it is still time for someone to really break out. But this was the first, I thought, breakout performance of the three-year-old Philly division this year. And then we've been waiting for this kind of statement win from somebody, anybody out there. Um, and Travelcom, I think, gave it to us on Saturday. And it was it was a little bit of a just result because I thought that she was she was best in the race where she lost to Clarier in the race with Alexandra. She had had a wider trip. She covered more ground. Um, so I think that she's a clear leader, leader of the division right now. Um, and, and just, just about Colonel Liam, he's an interesting case because he, you know, he's never, he hasn't run this gigantic speed figure. Um, he hasn't like really separated himself in terms of, you know, historically what great turf horses run, but he's definitely better than everything he's faced so far. And um, I assume he's going to go next in the Woodford reserve or the old forester turf, turf classic at, at Churchill. Um, so he's, he's another clear leader of a division that I think is lacking stars right now. I think you can say that about the three-year-old Philly division. I think you can say that about the turf division as well. So um, we'll see about that. United actually did win over the, over the weekend as well. Got a one Oh two buyer for Richard Mandela. He's turned into a really solid old pro. Uh, he keeps Mandela keeps teasing running him on the dirt in the future. Um, so we'll see if, if, if that comes to be. But those are the two I would want in the turf division right now. But two divisions definitely that are that are are, are seeking a star. And we'll see as the year goes on. Major news coming out of the three-year-old ranks. Uh, life is good. Had had to have a, a surgery, a minor surgery to get rid of an ankle chip in his one of his hinds. Uh, this is obviously a huge deal, and this is also why you don't bet horses at two to one in future pools, guys. But uh, you know, obviously, he was he was he stood out so far of the three year olds, and I think it's a good crop. But he stood out in terms of brilliance, and it's unfortunate that he's he's not going to make the Derby. I got to say, a lot of people, you know, I think took issue with the explanation that we got for his drifting out in the, in the San Felipe, you know, Mike Smith and Bob Abbott said it had to do with, with that, with the horse looking at the tote board. I think a lot of people didn't really buy that. And then it doesn't look great when about a week later, the horse has to go on the sidelines for surgery. Now I'm not saying that those two things are related. Like obviously he could have gotten hurt in that, in that workout, but I just I thought that was something that, that people were looking at a tad askew at that, you know, he, he has these problems with drifting and then he gets injured and has to, has to go on the sidelines, but it might just be one of those horses who's too fast for his own good. You know, like I've said in the past, um, we hope that he gets back and, and he can run some top races because I do want to see him get challenged and see what he's, he's really made of. Cause he's obviously super talented, obviously very brilliant, but uh, he, he, he hadn't, he hadn't passed the, the battle test that I, I wanted to see yet. So hopefully we get to see that uh, later in the year. That leads me into the uh, into the three-year-old standings, which if we can splash up right now. Um, so I'm not feeling great. Obviously, my horses have been exposed and sent up the track. Uh, you know, even, even Cattle River, who was my last my last hope, uh, was, was terrible in the, uh, in the Arkansas Derby, although I didn't like the ride that he got, or not the Arkansas Derby, the Rebel. Didn't like the ride that he got. We'll see um, if he does better next time. If I had to pick, if I had to make my future wager on this three-year-old contest, I would take Brian because I think he has the deepest staple. He's got greatest honor. He's got concert tour. Um, he's got a couple other horses that are in the mix and probably will be in the gate in Louisville. Um, John, once again, is is the curse. He drafted Maxfield last year, and then he got hurt like two days later, and now he's missing two of his top horses, including Life is Good. So I think it's a battle between Brian and Alan. I'm going to take Brian going forward. Uh, just to toss to you guys, if you have any thoughts on life is good and or the contest. Well, first of all, in the uh, fantasy future wager contest, I closed at eight to one. Good bet. Get some money down on me. I got a good job. There's that elusive quality. So uh, back to life is good. Second time you called him elusive quality. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks for correcting me. The, um, yeah. the quality, of course. Why do I keep saying elusive quality? I guess I get him just, I don't know, old age. Not the same reason why you called those Phillies affirmed in Alidar. You're just, you're in a different time zone. Okay. What a minute, like, we, since John took a week off and we got out of the pick on John mode, we switched over to the pick on Bill mode. Um, all right. Essential quality, of course. So uh, looking at life is good. The, the story surrounding these horses is always so much from Baffert. He's going for the record-breaking win in the Derby to surpass Ben Jones. If he doesn't get it this year, he's going to get it. I, I mean, he's young enough that he probably has, who knows, three, four more Derby wins left in him. But, you know, can he 
but look what he did last year. He had uh, Blaine and Charlatan were his two big guns. They both go down. He winds up in the Derby with two horses, one of which has to be scratched prior to the race, and he wins the thing. So are we going to see Baffert come in this year with his bench, led, I assume, by Concert Tour, and that bench being better than everybody else's A-team? That's always a possibility. Now, uh, life is good. They have to bring him back to the races. They have to accomplish something. He hasn't done enough yet to completely maximize his stallion value or hasn't won a grade one. So, you know, look at Haskell Travers, those sort of things, and we'll have him for the second half. But, you know, and have an exciting second half with him, maybe going up against the horses that fared well in the Triple Crown. Yeah, this is such a deep and talented group of three-year-olds that even with Life is Good out, who arguably was, you know, the, the top candidate, um, you know, of the group to, to win the Kentucky Derby, you know, it's still a very, very good group. You still have, you can go almost a dozen deep and still um, make a legitimate case in, in my estimation for who should win the Kentucky Derby. So this year's Derby is going to be really fascinating to me, um, aside from the fact that hopefully we'll have something running there, but be that as it may, there's, there's just a lot of, we, we're looking up at the standings and just going, wow, these are really, really good horses. Um, and ones that hopefully will stay sound and continue to campaign for the remainder of the year and into their four-year-old year, because there's a lot of money. There's a lot of million dollar races and grade one races to be run um, through the, the rest of the, uh, the rest of the year. Um, and a lot of these horses are going to be battling for some of these other races, you know, whether it's the Haskell or the Indiana Derby or the Pennsylvania Derby, I mean, there's still a lot of money on the table. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to this group, even though life is good as out now, he may come back for the second half and be a monster, um, you know, for the second half when everyone has already gone through the buzzsaw of the triple crown. Um, that being said, I know, Bill, a couple of weeks ago, you were you were making fun of me, and rightfully so, about why didn't I pick my own horse? The reason why I didn't pick Helium uh, in the contest is because I just have a curse. I just, you know, have continued to pick horses that continually get picked off. So I was really pleased when you picked um, essential quality or elusive quality, depending on who you're asking, <laughs> um, and, and left me with life is good because I really thought that life is good was the was the top of a talented, talented group of three year olds. Um, so sorry for, for Team Baffert that I picked that horse, uh, but uh, it's very self-serving because hopefully helium will uh, will improve because of this. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. So I wanted to plug uh, this weekend's races. There's two major cards, one in Florida, one across the world. We got the Florida Derby card at Gulfstream. A uh, lot of stakes action. Should be a really terrific day of racing. And then we have the Dubai World Cup card um, in, at Maidan on Saturday. Uh, just wanted to run down some of the potential fields. And, and, and the Florida Derby, obviously greatest honor is going to be a big favorite. He's an interesting horse because he's he's a lot faster on the thoroughbred figures right now than he is on wire figures. Um, there are a couple horses in there that might give him some problems. Uh, Spielberg's going to run in there after running well in the Rebel. Uh, Soup and Sandwich, who's an undefeated horse for, for Mark Cassie. It's pretty interesting stepping up. Uh, known agenda for, for Todd Pletcher. And I think the main challenger on paper is Collaborate, who had that blowout maiden win for Safi Joseph, uh, who's the TDN rising star. Um, so that's an interesting, and a lot of light, 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 lightly raced horses taking on greatest honor is a little bit more exposed and we'll see if you can continue to move forward. Um, in the Gulfstream Park Oaks, we'll have a, a, a matchup between Malathot for Todd Pletcher, who I believe hasn't run since the Demoiselle. So, you know, time is ticking away to, to get those Kentucky Oaks points and simply Ravisher who's coming back for, for Ken McPeak, uh, grade one winner from last year, who was um, a little bit disappointing. I thought in the, in the Breeders' Cup juvenile uh, over in, in Dubai, then in the, in the golden Shaheen Japan, who was this dynamite three-year-old sprinter last year, and then disappointed at a short price in the Breeders' Cup sprint. He's going to be in the, in the golden Shaheen. Uh, you, Going back to Gulfstream and the Appleton, Frostmourne, who used to be a really nice horse for uh, Christophe Coleman and then kind of disappeared for a while. He's, he's back for Eddie Keneally, um, who's going to run in the Appleton. It's a really, really, really nerdy thing to be excited about, the return of Frostmourne. But uh, that's that's why we host this show, because we're, we're nerds. Um, elsewhere on Saturday, obviously in the Dubai World Cup, the, the, the headliner is Mystic Guide. 
ran that monster, monster race in the Razorback and doesn't, you know, doesn't draw a, a huge load of, you know, top challengers in the Dubai World Cup. I think a lot of people, a lot of horses are passing on it this year because um, either they ran in the in the Pegasus or the uh, Saudi Cup. So it's, it's, I don't know, Jesus' team, you, you want to get excited about him or Sleepy Eyes Todd or I don't know. I think it's pretty much just Mystic Guy. Um, and we'll see if he can be as brilliant as he was um, in the Razorback. Also, we got the UAE Derby there as well. And uh, Mishrif, who won the, the Saudi Cup, is going to go back on turf in the Shima Classic. So that's just some of the stuff to look forward to this Saturday. So last week we talked about this, about the uh, the horseman's lawsuit to try to stop um, Haiza from going into effect. It's scheduled to go into effect next July. And uh, we, we kind of flamed the horseman a little bit for I, I thought what I thought was a little bit of a petulant, attention-seeking lawsuit. Um, Bill wrote a similar op-ed. It was a really good op-ed. You should go read it if you have it um, in the TDN. Making the case that he made last week on the show that trainers like blue-collar trainers that do things the right way should be all for this because this is the this is the best chance that they have at a level playing field which they haven't had ever in racing. Now there was a lot of there was a lot of pushback, a lot of a lot of um, response op eds to Bill's piece. Um, I'm going to let him defend himself mostly, but the one thing I would say that I noticed from the responses is that it's kind of like what we were saying last week that there were really no there were no arguments of merit the merit of the current system, which I think is the argument you have to make, if not in court, then at least in the court of public opinion and public opinion in racing has shifted towards unification. So I think that's the kind of argument you have to make. And I didn't see one argument that was like, here is why this system is working so well and why we need to keep it up. And then there was, there were really no arguments like that. And it, um, I think, you know, just falling back on this idea of, of this vague idea of constitutionality is kind of a cop out because then you don't have to answer for why this was necessary in the first place. And to me, that's that's the crux of the issue here is that this didn't happen. This Heisa didn't come to be out of thin air. It didn't materialize just because some you know powerful people in racing wanted it. It happened out of necessity because there were so many crises in racing that the states could not get a hold of. And, you know, that to me is, is the argument you have to make that this is, here's what we're doing better. Here's what we are going to do better to improve the current system. There wasn't even any of that really. Like there was some vague nods to, you know, we all want to see a clean sport and we want to see like better drug rules and blah, blah, blah. But you've had time, you've had decades to get this right at a state level and you haven't even come close so to me, if you're not going to make a merit argument as to why the current system is better than what might be in place in a year from now, then I think you really don't have a leg to stand on, especially in the court of public opinion. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I mean, where do I want to start here? Uh, a lot of thoughts about this that, um, you know, first of all, I'm not sure these lawsuits reflect what horsemen really think. And the reason why I say that is, I mean, you can't pull all the horsemen. You can't even pull 10 percent of them. But look at who supported this lawsuit, the Oregon HPPA, the Arizona HPPA. As I pointed out in my story, where's New York? Where's Florida? Where's California? Where's Kentucky? Where are those horsemen? I mean, it's because they I, I can't say they're definitely against this because they didn't join in the lawsuit. But at the very least, they're not that enthusiastic about the lawsuit. The other thing, too, that surprises me, um, you know, I have no dog in this fight. I, I, you know, I'm not an owner, I'm not a trainer. My part of being in the game is as a horse player. And one thing I think a lot of people, especially horsemen, don't realize, horse players couldn't care less about this. Matter of fact, I think horse players kind of like it because they love betting that Jorge Navarro horse off the claim at four to five and having it winning. So, you know, it doesn't really affect me, you know, but, but someone who likes horse racing and cares about it wants to see something happened for the good of the game. And so I'm glad you brought up some of the points you did because I mean, really, I don't even understand what their argument is. And they have never really articulated. And if they just say we're against this because it's constitutional, that's a load of crap. Then nobody could possibly care. From a horseman's standpoint, nobody could possibly care whether a law is constitutional or unconstitutional. They just don't want this to happen. The only thing I can think of, because I, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, they're not telling you the full story. 
The only thing I can think of is they're petrified that this means LASIKs is going to go away, which it probably is going to go away, not just in the graded states, but in all of racing. But, you know, if that's your if that's your point, you know, why, why wouldn't you just come out and say that? Because, again, it's not just I don't think anybody buys this. We're so concerned about constitutionality, you know, that we have to stand up for the American way. Come on. Yeah. And I think, you know, having having the week off, I really had a chance to to read not only Bill's excellent piece, I thought, um, in, in the Thurber Daily News. And I'm not just saying that because you're here, Bill. I, I really, you know, it, it was a really poignant piece, um, but also in reading some of the op-ed pieces that, that have come out afterwards. And, and, and it's still, everyone's kind of circling around, everyone who wrote the op-ed pieces are kind of circling around the issue, which is, um, yeah, you know, we, we just don't want to have things change. We like the status quo. And, and I think the, the one problem um, that, that I think, you know, that they're running into is that, that, you know, public perception is they want things to be safer. They want things to be cleaner. They want the cheaters out of the business. And I think we're all trying to go into that direction. Um, now, you know, whether they go in, you know, on their own, uh, you know, volition or kicking and screaming, it almost doesn't matter because we've had decades and decades as an industry to try to clean ourselves up. And all we've proven to, to ourselves is that we can't do it. So if we need to have a greater power than ours to come in and clean up the sport and make it an even playing field, I think the majority of people in the industry should want that. Um, now, I think, Bill, the, the one issue that, that people have come up with time and time again that, that I, I can understand is, you know, to say, well, if you're not if you're not for this, then you must be for the cheaters. And, and I don't think that's what necessarily what you meant, but I think a lot of people are kind of you know reacting to that as far as saying, well, I'm not for this because I have my reasons, but I'm not a cheater, and that that was kind of like the reason why there's there's you know the, this uh, this reaction from you know from I really think from the minority from from the from the non-silent the loud uh, minority right now, but overall um, we need Haiza. We need to have the adults in the room to come in and clean up the mess that we've made as an industry and to make it an even playing field. And we've talked about this ad nauseum, but at the end of the day, this is going to happen. It's going to happen. So if you're coming in and saying, well, we want it to happen under these set of rules, where were you a year ago? Where were you two years ago? Where were you six months ago with some of these ideas? And some of them aren't bad. I mean, you know, to have representation, you know, by by different states, you know, almost like a House of Representatives, you know, based on starts, that, that's a good idea. I can get behind that. But like the, the, the horse is out of the barn. OK, it's too late. We've already proven ourselves time and time again, we can't police ourselves. So this is the best option that we have. And we all just kind of have to go forward with it and embrace it because this is a brave new world and we're going forward in it. Yeah, and you know, I, there's, it's not to say that, like John's saying, it's not to say that there aren't you know valid arguments as to why this is a little tricky. I think there's two major arguments that are legit. One is the is the is the authority and who's going to seek the authority, who's going to be on the authority, because they are going to have a lot of power in in the in the new act. So that is a legitimate concern. And I think that it it, it would benefit from, from some transparency, like the selection process and, and and to have that kind of representation, have a couple horsemen on the authority. So I think that's a, that's a legitimate argument. The second is the logistical argument, how it's going to get paid for, you know. It's a godsend, I think, that USADA is even willing to get involved in this, but they're going to have to do a ton of drug tests, a lot more than they do in the human world. So that's a concern, too, and how we're going to pay for all that and logistically how that's going to work out. I think there are legitimate concerns. But as John said, and as I said last week, you've had years to you know bring your own solutions to these problems forward. And I haven't seen anything. And to me, you kind of lose your your moral high ground when you get up there and you talk about constitutionality and blah 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 and you haven't done anything to fix the core problem for all these years and i think that that's that's the main that's the main issue here for me is that you know if if uh, if i had heard these horsemen's groups over the years you know railing against drug trainers and trying to flush them out of their organizations and doing all this to try to increase racetrack shape, safety or at least at the very least, admitting that there's a problem that needs to be fixed, then I would say, yeah, this is nonsense that you guys are getting shut out of this process. But you have voluntarily have not been part of this process by and large for all these years. And now you want to complain that you're being shut out of it. Like, 
I'm sorry. It sucks that, you know, someone else had to come in and clean up our mess for us, but that's the way it is. And like John said, like I said, the train has left the station. It's time to get on board with this. If you want to try to negotiate behind closed doors for more representation, I support you in that. But at this point, like this is something that has been done without you because you have not contributed to any solutions for all these years. And that, that's that's my takeaway. And, and, you know, when you when you want to get involved now at the last minute and, and you know, throw your hands up and complain, it's it's runs a little hollow for me for, for a group of people that really have done nothing to clean up the game over all these years. Hey, Joe, let me get back to the point that I made in, in what I wrote and, and not saying whether, you know, the authority should have so many people or or whatever. And it, obviously it couldn't wouldn't even be writing about constitutional issues because I don't think that's all that relevant. But. It goes back not just to this example. You know, I started covering racing towards the tail end of the Oscar Guerrero era in New York. And, you know, you can say you can say mean things about dead people because they can't see you. He was he's the greatest cheater that ever lived in the history of this sport. And yet you never and he would pound these guys, you know, the honest trainers, the guys with 12 percent win percentages and nine, 10 horses in their barn. And to the point, you know, some of them actually got out of the game simply because of this one trainer. But where is the sense of outrage? And I don't for it's one of these like racetrack things. Like you're not allowed to speak poorly of another trainer or something like that. So, you know, where's where was the outrage then? You know, look at service in Navarro. You know, uh, look at how many races they won where if they weren't drugging their horse, the horse that finished second theoretically would have won hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, it's, it's if he put a gun in somebody's ribs and said, stick it up. It's really not that different. He robbed people of this money. He allegedly robbed people of this money. Yet, not only do you not get the horsemen screaming about, get these bums out of the game, or we got to make drug testing better. Matter of fact, we need this Heiser thing. Just, you know, see no evil, hear no evil. Even worse, not only do they see no evil, hear no evil, they are taking steps to uh, combat what, I still say the vast majority of people in this sport think is the best solution anybody could have come up with cleaning up the game. And I do agree with you. I've been told by people and understand this a lot better than me. At the end of the day, everybody's pretty confident this lawsuit will fail. But, you know, they've got this whatever Liberty Foundation, whatever goofballs things that they align themselves with. If they want to I can tie this up for six or seven years in the courts. And, you know, really, that would be such a shame to see that happen. When we were on the precipice of finally getting something to happen to clean up the sport after, you know, 150 years of, of garbage and drugs. And, it, you know, it's not going to be perfect. There's still going to be problems. But I think most people who really understand the issues, and I know you and uh, John would agree with me, understand that this, this you know, it's, it's very simple. And you, you said this sort of status quo doesn't work. So what do you do? You have to change the status quo. You just have to. Now, maybe that what you change it to isn't perfect, but it's sure better than what we have now. And, you know, I think trainers, you know, you know, 99.5% of them are honest. Don't cheat. Why aren't they outraged by the people who steal money from them? Owning multiple grand stakes winning racehorses like Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. A little West Point news this week. Uh, hard Not to Love has been retired. She obviously had a terrific career, grade one winner. Um, it'll be interesting to see who she's bred to. She's also a TDN rising star, so I'm sure that jacks up the value even more. Um, and then John, who, who went in with West Point to buy Turned Aside, son of American Pharaoh, turf sprinter, is going to run in the Shaker Town next weekend at Keeneland. So best of luck to John and all the partners at West Point. So in the news this week are the Ramses, and they haven't been in the news for a while now. I feel like their 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 operation has shrunk steadily over the years, um, and this could be part of the reason. Uh, apparently, the Ramses have fallen behind on their bills uh, with Wesley Ward and Mike Maker. Bill had a story about this the other day. Uh, Ward is alleging that the Ramses have piled up unpaid bills totaling nine hundred seventy four thousand seven hundred ninety dollars. 
and Maker Clay Bazaar MCs only owe him 905000 $357 should mention that the story was first reported in Pollock report. Uh, this is kind of interesting because it, it's coming off the heels of the Zayat mess. And there's more news, I think, today in the TDN about Zayat and his problems. Uh, it's it's a weird thing when you see these, you know, kind of marquee stables going under. Maybe it's, he's not the Ramses aren't going under completely, but they definitely have to reshuffle and drastically reduce their numbers, I think, here. Wesley Ward and Mike Maker are both seeking for the horses to be sold and for them to be paid off of that because I'm guessing they don't trust Ken Ramsey to, to pay them after all this time and stacking up all these bills. But I just, my question about it is, how does it get to this point? Like, it, it must be, and I'm not an owner, but it must be that, you know, there's so much leeway given to owners, especially top owners who trainers know are going to be able to put them in the big races that, you know, they just get so much rope to where, you know, you turn around and you're owed a million dollars by an owner. And that happened to Zaya too. And it's just, I also wonder how it happens in these cases. I understand that owning horses is not a great investment overall, but these are guys that have had stallions have had commercially successful stallions. And that's supposed to be the way that you stack up that money to where you can just play around on the racetrack as you sell a stallion for a lot of money for eight, nine figures like Zayat did assuming, I don't know exactly what he sold him for, but you know, this is, that was, that's the sh- sh- surprising part to it uh, about it to me is that kittens joy and American Pharaoh, their owners, you know, five years later, 10 years later are having money problems. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. There are a lot of things I don't understand about the, the world of, of big money and, and, and debt, but uh, this is not, not, not uh, too auspicious for the Ramseys going forward. And it's unfortunate because they've, I think Ken Ramsey overall has been a good owner and has, has brought a lot of positive attention to the sport and has, you know, kind of done the right things by his horses mostly. So this is, this is unfortunate, but I'll, I'll toss it over to you guys. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this, the, the bigger story, I think, and I'm sure John will have an opinion on this, have a good opinion on this, is how unbelievably difficult it is to own racehorses and try to make money. And he said, and they even caught the, the golden goose with the stallion, the kitten's joy, and still, you know, the racing operation, which at one point, I mean, they must have had 100 horses, if not more, at their height. And, uh, you know, you would think, who's more successful than the Ramseys? You know, you see these kitten horses winning grass races all over North America. And you think, wow, these guys must really be doing good. And then, you, you know, how expensive is it? Well, look at that. This million dollar debt to Ward and uh, Mike Baker weren't, uh, didn't pile up over 10 years. I mean, uh, the, the legal papers I saw, Wesley Ward started the, uh, uh, the point where he was going after uh, Ramsey is last June. So, you know, these are the kind of bills. I mean, and it's, you know, I it makes me look at an owners and say, well, you really got to love this sport or love this game because yeah, some people get lucky. Some people have a breakout horse, but by and large, if Ken Ramsey is going broke and we think that could be the case. So he, he says, otherwise owning race horses. What about the guy who just, you know, as, as much smaller operation is trying to make it go. It, it's gotta be extremely difficult. Yeah. Well, let's talk to a small owner and John Green. Small in stature, height, or small in yeah. number of horses? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, the, the answer first. is yes. Um, yeah, and, and when you do the math, you look at, at you know, what was owed, and it, and I'm not going to quote the exact numbers because I don't I just don't remember them, but it was something like Maker had 40 or 50 horses in training for the Ramseys and the same thing for, for Wesley Ward. Well, if it costs $3,000 a month for training, it's $100 a day, $3,000 a month for training times 50 horses – you know, he's behind four, maybe five months, which is still a lot. But I know when we talk to trainers, um, you know, we, we try to give them an idea of what the amount of time is going to be from the time that they bill us for us to review the bill and ultimately, you know, uh, pay them for, for training. And just like everything else, sometimes it's 15 days, sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it's 45 days. But, you know, to put the trainers under that kind of financial pressure of not paying for 100 days, 150 days, that, that's just unfair. And a lot of trainers can kind of weather the storm in the short term, especially if they know that 
they have top horses for you and that horse is going to run in a graded stake race soon, or that you have a wonderful stallion and that they're going to be able to, after breeding season is over and they get, uh, you know, remunerated for the stud fees that, that are owed, that they're going to be flush and, and pay you out. And that all works fine. And I think, like you said, Joe, you get a lot of rope at that point. But when Kitten's Joy goes from $100,000 in stud fee to $60,000 in stud fee to, I think now he's quote unquote private, um, what that means is that he's not worth as much, which means stud fees aren't coming in as, as quickly as possible. And that might be part of the problem. Um, the other thing is the Ramseys had an operation that was so vast. I mean, they were running in so many different states that they got to the point where, and they were breeding so many horses, they got to the point where they were representing themselves as consigners in sales, which again is sunken costs. Um, and if you're, if, if people aren't as excited about Kitten's Joy in this, you know, in this example, then you're not going to be able to sell them for as much money as you had in the past. So I think it was kind of a perfect storm of, you know, maybe slow pay, um, not getting the stud fees to the extent that they thought they were going to get. There's a, I'm sure there's a whole host of reasons why, but the bottom line is it's unfair to drag somebody out that long when you're talking four five, six, maybe 12 months um, and being behind because they have people that they have to pay. So now they're paying out of pocket for your horses. And, and in the short term, it's kind of an understanding, but in the long run, that's just not a fair situation. So I don't blame the trainers for taking this action, you know, many, many, many months after they're owed uh, monies. And my understanding is that the strategy worked because as soon as it got out in public that they were going to court and they were going to sue for past due fees, that a settlement was, you know, was, was uh, completed almost immediately. I mean, I think, I think the article came out, you know, one day and then like two days later, um, Bill's article came out maybe the day later saying we've taken care of all this and, and, and a settlement is in place. So obviously, you know, they knew that they owed the money. It was just a matter of trying to come to a meeting in the minds to figure out how to how to pay them back. Um, but Bill, to go back to your point, it's almost impossible to make money in the horse business. And unless you have a stallion prospect or a horse that wins a lot of money on the racetrack and then becomes a stallion prospect for years and years and years, um, the, the economics are really difficult. They really, really are. I, I just always think it's it's interesting when trainers get stiffed because I I would think that that's the first built in expense you have as a as a horse owner is I have to pay the trainer I have to pay the day rate I have to pay the bills in the barn and it just so often it seems like they're the first people to get stiffed instead and I think a lot of it like I said does have to do with you know Ramsey and Zayat horses were so valuable to these barns that you know you you let them slide a lot when you wouldn't necessarily with a small owner who has one or two ho horses with you so um I, I i that that's the thing that i think oh, the, the way that i think trainers find themselves in trouble is they give too much leeway to these big barns because they're worried about them saying oh well i'll just go take my 50 horses to someone else who will let me be delinquent on my bills um so yeah to, to hopefully they get they get at least some of their money back because you know, maybe not now, but at some point, Zaya and Ken Ramsey had a lot more money than Mike Maker and Wesley Ward. So I don't I, I don't want to see the relatively smaller guys get stiffed here. Joe, there's an old saying in the horse business about people people love buying horses, they hate paying for them. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine. So I mentioned this last week, uh, and then I wanted to have John on before we spoke about it at length. I'm still not going to go too deep into it, but I, I, I do think it's important to talk about OBS March um, last week because it was the start of a new sales season, and I think it was kind of the uh, the, the symbolic start of, of, of spring and this this new year for racing. And, and obviously, last year's OBS March sale was conducted under extremely difficult circumstances, considering that, I, I mean, I was surprised they even held the sale, but I guess the wheels had been in motion for so long and they were so close that they thought, let's just do it as the coronavirus pandemic was, was shut, shutting everything down. So here we are a year later and there is a ton more optimism. Obviously, we're still in our little boxes here. We're not back in the studio yet, but I think that that's coming fairly soon. Um, the people are getting vaccinated by the millions every single day. I think overall, there's a lot more optimism and that trickles down to the racing world. And I predicted, not that this was a bold prediction, but I predicted that the results at OBS March would be 
you know, a lot better than last year. And that, that bore out Brian and Steve, Brian Dinato and Steve Chirac did really good work covering the sale um, last week. And I just wanted to mention the numbers a uh, total of 326 two-year-olds sold for $38,265,000 last year. Um, 295 had grossed $24,349,500. So the average went from 97, 92, 7, 10 to 117,377. So that's a big increase in the average. Also, the buyback percentage was hugely reduced. Last year, it was 38.8%, which makes sense. You want to hold on to, to your assets in a time of uncertainty. This year, it's only 16.2%. So that is a very low percentage. And I think that to me is the biggest uh, harbinger of, of a, a much better sales season and a much better two-year-old racing season. Uh, but I know John was probably involved down there along with Brian. I uh, wanted to get his thoughts on OBS. The OBS March sale was like the breaking of a dam. It was spring break for college students. It was the Amish coming off the farm to the big city for the first time. You know, at the end of a Weight Watchers meeting, people run into the bakery. I mean, they <laughs> couldn't get horses purchased fast enough. It was so incredible. So congratulations to all the pinhookers who in September and October bought yearlings when things were very uncertain and had the inner fortitude to say, I'm moving forward because they were well, well paid um, when it comes to the March sale. One of the things that really stood out to me when I looked at the numbers and I looked at the, the, the top horses that sold, you know, and Joe, you mentioned the stats, which were spot on, you know, the buyback rate was down. Number of scratches were down also, because usually sometimes if people have horses entered in the sale and they just feel like that the, the money's not there, they'll scratch the horse before it goes into the ring to avoid paying a commission to the sales company. Um, and that was, that was reduced. And all the other major financial numbers were up, averages, median, you know, horses sold. So it was just a very stout sale. How about this, though? Five out of the top seven horses that sold were fillies. That's a, that's a difference. Usually it's the other way around. Usually it's five out of seven Colts, uh, top Colts were, were sold. Um, and you go down the list and it's, you know, not just the usual suspects. I mean, you do have American Pharaoh, you have Munnings, Uncle Mo. Absolutely, they were represented. But other ones that were in the top horses, a Contheros Colt sold for 575000 a Violence Colt sold for five fifty, a Cairo Prince Colt for 525000 and the sales topper was a practical joke who hasn't even had horses of racing age yet. This is his first crop, and that was a sales topper of $750,000. Ironically enough, just to go full circle on this show, the practical joke comes from Helium's family. So you're welcome to Top Line Sales for helping you help the industry. Ooh. Wow. Maybe that'll maybe that'll make helium a stallion prospect if she's good too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, seven hundred fifty thousand dollar practical joke, Philly. I, I echo John's uh, insights. I thought it was interesting that some of the top horses, most of the top horses, were Phillies, um, and that a freshman sire had the topper because you don't you don't really often see that topper was bought by Japan's Hideyuki Mori, who was the top buyer. Um, he bought eight two year olds for a total of two point two four five million dollars. So oh, obviously, good to see that international participation. I think the online bidding world is, is growing as well. And, and people feel more comfortable with that. So I think there's, there's more of that to come, but yeah, I think over, it was just, it, there was a feeling of rebirth with this sale. And I think that that's going to continue as the virus continues to recede. And, and it's obviously can't happen soon enough, but I think we're, we're on a clear trajectory here that things are going to get better, at least by the summer. Um, so then af after that, we have the basic sale, the basic Gulfstream sale later this month. And the next month, as I mentioned, the open Keeneland, April two-year-olds and horses of racing age sale. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com.
The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is Canterbury Park's VP of Racing Operations, Andrew Offerman. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So we're glad to have you. We're glad to give a little bit of shine to the smaller tracks. And I think you guys do a lot, a lot of really good things at Canterbury. The first good thing that I wanted to ask about was the slashing of the pick five takeout down sure. to 10%. That was a huge deal, I think, for horse players. But it's hard, I think, to break through sometimes as a smaller track into the national horse player consciousness. I remember a ways back, Ellis Park had a 4% pick four takeout. It was great value, but not enough people bet it. So they had to raise the takeout back up. So my question for you is, what kind of impact have you seen on business by lowering takeout? Sure. You know, we've kind of had a couple of different forays into takeout reduction. Um, did some more across the board a few years ago that didn't work as successfully as the pick five takeout reduction did last year. But um, last year when we were kind of forced to change our business strategy from really being on track centric to trying to focus on the off track betting markets, we knew that we had to do something to become more attractive um, beyond just kind of running through the middle of the week. So looking at our pick five and trying to do something unique with that wager as it seemed to grow in popularity seemed like a good opportunity. Uh, the results were great. I mean, from our perspective, it enhanced our visibility, did a lot for, I think, uh, not only our pick five, but, uh, but also our, our other pools around those races uh, and really kind of showed us a, a new ability to generate interest uh, at a pool that averaged, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of $80,000, which for us is pretty substantial. Hey, Andrew, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. And um, Canterbury is in the um, position, like a few other racetracks in the country, we have no alternate source of revenue. Uh, you don't have this sales like Keeneland does. You don't have the Derby like Churchill does. And, and most obvious, you don't have slot machines like dozens and dozens of tracks do. That must be a very hard way to run a business and to keep yourself out of the red. But since you're a publicly traded company, um, you know, we know what the success story is at Canterbury. I believe you've been uh, profitable for like 90% of the year since you've been keeping records of this. So how are you able to do it? Sure. We've got a couple of unique uh, things that, that kind of help us out here in Minnesota. We've obviously, since the Sampsons uh, bought the track, along with Mr. Dale Shenian um, back in the 90s, have really kind of focused on the entertainment aspect of the business. So that's true not only for our racing, but also through our alternate um, revenue streams. We do a lot to, to, to still cater to um, what I consider kind of the novice racing fan when we draw about 6,500 people per race day in a, in a normal non-COVID circumstance. Um, we do have table games. So although we don't have slot machines, we do have the ability to offer poker and blackjack, which is an important revenue stream to us. And we also obviously um, pretty well known have a good marketing agreement uh, with the Mystic Lake Casino, which is just five miles down the street that supports uh, a lot of our racing products. So it's kind of a unique blend of uh, entertainment opportunity, as well as some creative solutions um, with local businesses and local entertainment venues that kind of allow us to focus on a little bit different, uh, maybe core customer than uh, than maybe you've seen other racetracks across the country. And Andrew, it's John Green, and and you know, first of all, thanks for coming on. We 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 really enjoy having you here. Um, yeah, we all you. grew up with smaller boutique racetracks, uh, you know, Mammoth Park and 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 Keystone Racetrack, and some of the other ones here on the East Coast. And and it's akin to to what you're doing at Canberra Park, as far as you know, you don't want to be the biggest and 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 the you know the the top grade one uh, races being offered because that's not necessarily your clientele or your marketplace. Um, but this year, especially, you've you've implemented some really unique incentive programs. Can you go through some of those just uh, as, as far as you know what you're trying to do to incentivize and encourage people to come race in Minnesota. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate asking. Appreciate you asking about that. Um, we've always tried to kind of come up with unique things. We realize that when you look at kind of the normal um, areas that people race across the country, Minnesota is not necessarily on their map. So, trying to come up with unique things that make it a, an exciting place to be um, have always been a focal point for us. We really kind of have three major focal points to try to get people interested in coming here this year. One is a, an early race. Uh, an early meet incentive program that gives everybody that starts in an open overnight race an additional thousand dollars throughout the month of May um, to try to help offset the costs of shipping because we acknowledge that most people have a long van ride to get here from wherever they might be uh, during the winter. 
We also kind of guarantee uh, stipends uh, per, per starter over the course of the meet. And that's a program that we've kind of tweaked over the years, but kind of based on the idea of paying down to all participants and making sure to try to cover the costs of getting that horse to the races. That's tiered kind of by purse level, but starts at $200 and works its way up from there. Uh, and then along with our horsemen, we've been able to offer kind of an interest-free loan program um, for qualified applicants. So along with our stall application process, we accept shipping loans uh, where people are able to kind of list their interests and what they're intending to bring to the season. And if they qualify um, through our, our committee, they're able and eligible to sign a basically zero free interest uh, shipping loan that they can pay back over the course of the summer. So those are really the three things that we're doing to try to incentivize people's behavior um, to get here. And those, those are all good programs. I wanted to ask, you know, we, we, we touched on, you know, how you have to, how you have to try to break through in the horse play in the horse players market. Um, but you do have a loyal following in Minnesota. And like you said, you do get good attendance. What are the, some of the things that you've done to build that following at Canterbury? And do you think any of them, can you extrapolate them to the national market? Sure. I mean, I think that really when you, when you, when you go back and look at our history, we've done, everything from little things um, that are focused on the guest experience up to, you know, large entertainment driven specific events. I don't think that it would surprise anybody to know that we were early adopters of some of the unique uh, extreme days um, coming up with unique racing conditions, doing, you know, all sorts of different types of dog races, um, focusing on alternative, alternative entertainment as part of the races, but also, you know, we really try to do things that focus on the, the family nature of the entertainment business that focus on the value of the entertainment we can bring. Um, we adopted a long time ago, kind of a discount promotional evening. Buck night was our Thursday night tradition for a long time. And it continues, um, you know, to kind of be a core part of what we're about. And that's focusing on one day a week that can really provide a low cost entertainment alternative. Uh, and with that, we've driven, you know, Thursdays from when we started uh, back in the nineties, somewhere around 1500, uh, person attendance days to uh, the last non-COVID year, it was up closer to 7,500 in terms of average attendance. Um, and then focusing on kind of the family aspect, you know, we early on in, in Canterbury Park's history found um, some great partners that wanted to be involved in the family entertainment aspect, one of them being uh, Rainbow Playsets, who built one of their largest uh, playgrounds on property and gave kind of alternative uh, opportunities for kids and families to have fun at the races and have combined that kind of with interactive experience with kids having a chance to pet and see horses and different opportunities for pony rides and some of those things that maybe don't fit the normal, you know, racetrack atmosphere, but give kind of families a good opportunity to come out and enjoy themselves at the racetrack. Andrew, going back to the pick five and with that carryover, excuse me, the, the takeout that low, I think it's safe to assume that the computer players that made so much uh, noise and have been sort of controversial are not playing that bet because they actually don't like lower takeouts because it cuts into their rebate. So in general, what do you feel about this? Uh, what is your feelings on this overall subject and what has been Canterbury's experience with, you know, again, the computer guys come in and pouring in, you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in the pool at the very last second. Sure. You know, not necessarily an expert on, on the computer players, but I do think that what's been appealing about the lower takeout wagers is that um, it, it makes it feel more approachable to a larger audience. Obviously, as a smaller racetrack, I don't have the advertising budget that, that uh, you know, some of the larger properties do. So to get attention of the masses uh, and get their interest, I need to do something that kind of generates a little bit of its own promotional value. Um you know, outside of just a straight marketing spend. So I think that getting people excited about it and interested in it and feeling like there's good value there, um, which, you know, obviously the low takeout rate and if holds true to your your thought process that, that it reduces computer play, I think that in those scenarios, it, it becomes an appealing bet to the masses and really kind of helps us project ourselves across a wider audience without the marketing spend to maybe do that uh, otherwise. Andrew, one last question from from me, and, and it's more on the on the racing side. Um, one of the things that we've seen on some of the, the senior circuits is, if, you know, trainers that that uh, you know have um, drug positives or get kicked out of their stalls because of of moral issues. Uh, you know, tweeting things that are insensitive. Um, you know, and and they're trying to land at other racetracks. Um, what's 
Canterbury's stance on a, on a trainer who maybe has a checkered past um, that applies for, for, for stalls there. It, is that part of the rubric as far as, you know, is there a moral clause as far as the rubric of giving them stalls? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a code of conduct policy that, that anybody that applies for stalls here is required to sign in addition to the regular stall application that acknowledges that they need to, you know, fulfill certain criteria to be able to race here. Um, and that's something that we take seriously and make sure that they acknowledge that as part of their of their uh, desire to be here um, and something that we instituted maybe three or four years ago um, that has helped us not only you know with some of those issues, but also kind of in our relationship with our state racing commission and, and others throughout the industry. Andrew, you talked about some of the the uh, initiatives and the incentives that you're you're trying to get more horses there early in the meet, more owners, more trainers. Uh, I know you you guys are doing something with uh, with a racing club, which is kind of all the rage these days. Can, can you talk about that? Yeah, Canterbury Park was really on the forefront of kind of the racing club concept. Jeff Madey, our player relations manager, kind of created that idea uh, ten or twelve years ago, and this year. We've kind of partnered with Wasabi Racing Stables, who's become kind of well known across the industry for some of their initiatives. They're going to actually run our racing club concept. Um, Joe Skirto, who runs the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project, which is a group that Canterbury Park and our horsemen's groups finance, um, really does work in trying to recruit new owners and come up with new concepts for ownership. So he's not only got them involved, but really kind of worked on creating a bevy of options for people that want to invest as little as two hundred and fifty dollars, you know, really up to as much as they want to spend. But trying to create different increment ownership levels kind of throughout people's budgets to try to you know grow ownership and make ownership a more interesting uh, and compelling aspect of our project. So growing owners at home is important to us. Great stuff. Um, we appreciate the time, Andrew. Just for anyone who wants to support Canterbury, the meet opens May 18th and runs through September 16th. They usually run Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, later post time, five o'clock post time. Um, so you can usually get involved after the larger tracks are done for the day. You guys do a lot of great stuff. Get involved, if nothing else, for that pick five takeout. Thanks so much for joining us, Andrew. Thank you. Appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, Andrew. Right. Great job. Talk to you. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Andrew Offerman, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust The Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit The Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. I just wanted to mention this before we sign off, you know, in, in the vein of things looking better with the with the pandemic and the sales market, uh, tracks are starting to let fans back in back in and sports arenas have done the same thing. I got to say, as a, as a diehard New York Rangers fan, it's been great to hear that crowd, that sometimes obnoxious crowd in the garden again. It just it, it adds so much. And even the NCAA tournament over the weekend, just even if it's a limited capacity, it just adds so much to have that energy in the building. And I think, you know, as as the, the situation gets safer, we're going to see that ramped up more and more. So racing is no different. Uh, Pimlico announced yesterday and Stronic Group announced that there are going to be 10,000 fans at the Preakness. I assume there are going to be even more at the Derby. We haven't heard a, an official number released yet from Churchill Downs, but I assume there's going to be even more because they have a greater capacity there. Uh, Santa Anita is going to start having fans again. April 2nd, uh, New York has already opened up a little bit. You can go to Aqueduct if for some reason you wanted to go there. Um, so there's the, 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 the tide is turning and I think it's, it's great for the sport. Obviously it's going to be great to have fans back in the stands. And honestly, I might, I might, I'm not usually a guy who goes to the track. I usually like to do my betting from home, but you know, having it taken away and having been away from the track for a long time, I think I've, I haven't been to the track since 2019 Saratoga. So that's a long time away from the track for me. So even I, might partake a little bit once Belmont opens. Um, so we're, we're happy about that. And, and we, we want everybody to go forward, you know, as safely and responsibly as possible. But this is definitely a, a positive turn for not just our sport, but all sports in general. We missed our fans. 
All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland April sale is April 26th. Entries are open now. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Andrew Offerman, our producer and fact checker, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Ritz, and our editors, Danny Seiper, Leo Laraca, and Anthony Laraca. Thank you so much for watching. Please wear a mask and get vaccinated if you can. We'll see you next week. Bye.